Welcome to Canon Conversation number 352. We're going over the questions in this book. Answers to 200 of life's most profound probing questions. I'm actually giving the answers. They're giving us the questions. The next question, let's see, I think I covered this one last time. If I marry to an unbeliever, should I stay or leave the marriage? Yeah, we covered that. We said that God says that the marriage, the unbelieving spouse is sanctified by the believing spouse and the children as well. So uh, if you are married to an unbeliever, you should stay because marriage is for life and they have a chance, better chance, a lot better chance of seeing Christ in you and being saved than if they stay with you as opposed to you leaving them. So if they'd be pleased to stay with you, then they should stay with you. Okay, then the next question is cruelty grounds for divorce? Well, no, the only grounds, actually God said when the Pharisees asked him, uh, can a man divorce his wife for any cause? And then Jesus said that, that, that from the beginning, he said, well, what does, what does the scripture say? And then they said, well, it said that Moses said to write her a bill of divorcement. And then Jesus says, Moses suffered that to be so due to the hardness of your heart, but from the beginning it was not so. For from the beginning God made male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. And he said, What God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. So, there really, as far as God is concerned, marriage is for life and there are no grounds for divorce. In every case, you should stay together. And people will say, well, that person beats me or this person verbally abuses me. It doesn't matter. You made an agreement to stay with the person for life. Psalm 15 asked the question, Lord, who shall sit upon thine holy hill? And one of the things is given in that short psalm is he that keepeth his word to his own hurt. God honors the person who does that and that's what you do when you when you say I accept you as my wife or as my husband for as long as we both shall live. And so that marriage contract is for life. And if something bad happens, the other person has a stroke, doesn't matter, you take care of them. The other person curses you out every day of your life, doesn't matter, you take care of them. You are with that person for life. So is cruelty grounds for divorce? No, there are no grounds for divorce. Now God does say that if a if a spouse has sex with someone else, they, in a sense, have divorced you because they've broken the marriage. The marriage bond is sex, and when you have sex with someone else, now you've broken the marriage bond that you had with the first person. And so, in that case, if you want to, you could leave at that time. Um, but, and that's what Jesus says there in Matthew 19. But if, as far as God is concerned, you should stay with your spouse for life, even if they cheat on you. If they cheat on you and they are sorry for it and want to stay with you, you should stay with them. But God does say it. You did break the marriage vow if you did that. So you could leave in that time. That's the only grounds for divorce. And that's not really you getting a divorce, it's the person's already divorced you by having sex with someone else. So is cruelty grounds for a divorce? No. Nothing is grounds for a divorce. Lying grounds for a divorce? No. Cheating? No. Stealing? No. Whatever. It's not grounds for a divorce. Next question. What is the difference between adultery and fornication? Uh, 
I would say that fornication is a word used for all sexual sin. And adultery means that you commit sexual sin against your spouse. Remember, uh, sex equals marriage. So if you're not married to anybody and you commit sexual sin, whether it's premarital sex and you don't get married, or whether it's sex of the mind, looking at pornography or fantasizing about somebody through a romance novel or a Hallmark movie, whatever it is, um, that's fornication. You can't commit, if you've never been married, you can't commit adultery. A virgin can sin sexually, but cannot commit adultery because you're not married to anybody. But if you are married to somebody and then you commit sexual sin, you have committed adultery against that person. Even if you, even if it's only in your mind, because Jesus said, you have heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you, he that lusts after a woman in his heart hath committed adultery in his heart. So adultery, is adultery and fornication are the exact same thing except if you're married and you commit a sexual sin you have committed adultery if you are unmarried and you commit a sexual sin it's fornication and you can call if you are married and you have and you commit a sexual sin you can also call that fornication so fornication is a broader category it applies to everybody who commits sexual sin, which is why that word is used more frequently when referring to sexual sin in the Bible as opposed to adultery. But adultery is still used. So really, that's the only difference. People like to say, um, people like to say, well, you know, if you don't physically commit adultery with the person, you know, if you don't physically have sex with somebody other than your spouse, then you haven't committed adultery. But Jesus blew that out of the water when he says, if you lust after a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery with her already in your heart. Um, the next question, is oral sex okay? Uh, the Bible doesn't address that. Um, the Bible is very specific, saying that you can only have sex with your spouse. I would say that God designed sex to join two people together. The way they are joined together is by intercourse, not by oral sex. And um, so that's how they're joined together. That's what God has in mind. And it should only be, and then the, the purpose of creating sex is so that you can have a family. So that the man and woman get married, they have sex, they're the only ones that have sex, and they create a family. That's why it's only between one man and one woman for life, because if you're having sex with other people, you're joined to other people, and then the result is you're having kids with other people. And so uh, God um, says that sex is sacred between only one man and one woman because that creates the marriage situation. So, um, again, oral sex isn't addressed, so I won't address that because the Bible doesn't say except to say that God says if you have sex with someone other than your spouse, you've sinned, and that you're only to have sex with your spouse for life. And so anything outside of that is going to be a sin, and anything within that is okay. Um, oral sex isn't designed by God to uh, make, you can't have babies through that, so that's not part of God's plan. Um, I think it's not... Um, it's certainly not part of the marriage family type thing, but if uh, if you do have oral sex with your spouse, the Bible doesn't forbid it. So um, I would suggest 
against it, but um, is it a sin? Is it okay? Uh, God doesn't forbid it, so if it's between a husband and a wife, then it should be fine. Does the Bible allow sex for pleasure? Uh, again, that goes that goes with the category of oral sex. Um, sex was designed to be between a husband and a wife with the intended result that they would have children as a result of the sex. And God made man and women's minds differently. And so God knew that the only way a man, even though the body parts only fit between a man and a woman, God knew that the only way a man and a woman would have sex and create babies is if it was pleasurable to some extent. And it's funny that the women desire children a lot more than men do and men get a lot more pleasure out of sex than women do. Well that's by design. The pleasure or fun that women typically have in sex is from the idea that they can carry a baby and have a family, have children. The pleasure that men have from sex is that they are that they are becoming one with the most beautiful creature that God made, woman. Um, so God designed men's minds and women's minds differently, but basically women get the pleasure from sex. I, I know there are exceptions, but for the most part, women get pleasure from sex through the result of it, babies, and men get pleasure from sex through the act itself. And uh, that's just how God designed the men and the women's minds. Knowing that if he didn't design it that way, then because the minds are different, then there wouldn't, you wouldn't have people creating babies and populating the world. So God did design sex to be pleasurable, or else you wouldn't do it, or else you would just have, you would just have sex with the same sex. And that's, since sex is turned into a, just a strictly pleasure thing, and it's divorced from the idea of having kids nowadays, that's why you have more sodomy going on today than you ever did. So, um, I see the question. Does the Bible allow sex for pleasure? Okay, the answer is yes. But um, that's not the intended purpose of sex. The primary purpose of sex is to have children. God makes it pleasurable so that you will have children. So God, the Bible does allow sex for pleasure. But that's not the intended thing. So, um, if sex for pleasure goes against God's design of having kids, then it is not allowed. Meaning, that doesn't mean if you're married and your wife is past childbearing age that you can't have sex with her. But it just means that you can't have sex with the same sex because you can't make babies that way. Uh, you can't have sex with someone other than your wife because if you do have babies that way, then it's not a family unit because you are not married to your wife. I mean, in God's eyes you are, but naturally, practically speaking, you're not because you, that person ends up being a single mom. That's why sex outside of marriage is a sin because the intended result of sex is to have babies and you should only have babies with someone you're married to for your life so you can raise them up and take care of them. So if you don't do that, then it's considered a sin. So in the example, and I mention all that because there's an example in the book of Genesis where God had decreed that if a man marries a woman and he has, and he dies and they have no children, then the man's brother is to marry her and raise seed that will be counted toward for him, the person who died. And there is an example in the book of Genesis where a guy dies before his wife has kids 
and so his brother marries her as the law required but he did not want to have kids with her but he still liked the idea of sex for pleasure so what he did was he had sex with her and whenever his seed came out of his body he spilled it on the ground so that he could still have the fun of sex with her but not have any babies and for that God killed him so uh, and as we're specifically told in Genesis that's why God killed him so that's why I say when you ask the question does the Bible allow sex for pleasure well God says that's not the intention and here is a rule that says you must raise seed to your brother who died by marrying his wife and having sex with her and creating babies and the guy didn't do it he wouldn't create babies with her and so God killed him for that so that right there shows you that the the number one goal of sex is not pleasure let me put it that way God does the Bible does allow sex for pleasure I mean, a lot of guys probably when they get married if they're trying to have kids and they're not able to and a lot of times it just doesn't work sperm count or she's not ovulating or whatever it is the reason it's just not working um, a lot of times then that just means they get to have more fun trying is all it is and there's nothing wrong with that you shouldn't say oh well my wife can't have kids or I can't have kids therefore we're not going to have sex um, sex binds a man and a woman and it, and the reason it does that is so that you will be committed to taking care of an offspring together uh, raising up that offspring that child and so you should still have sex between your the husband and wife even if you can't have kids just because it does bind the husband and wife together it makes that marriage bond stronger but um, and but if that's what you're doing again it's not for the primary goal there isn't pleasure so um, so I guess the answer to the question does the Bible allow sex for pleasure is yes but it's just a it's not the primary goal it's so, it's sort of like asking um, does the does God allow you to work at a job that you like well yeah if you got a job that you like and get paid for that's wonderful um, but that's not the primary reason you have a job to do something you like the primary reason you have a job is to make money and take care of your family uh, so that's the same thing with sex does the Bible allow sex for pleasure well yeah if you have as long as you have sex according to God's design and you have pleasure doing and that more power to you but that's not the that's not the goal of sex and if it's just if that's all you're doing it for then I would say it is a sin okay uh, next question let's see if we can get that in uh, are interracial dating and marriage all right are interracial dating and marriage all right uh, today yes <laughs> Uh, the the way, that, way that comes about is in the Old Testament God set Israel apart they were God says in Deuteronomy 7 that Israel is a holy nation that, they, that God has set Israel above all other nations Ephesians 2 14 refers to a middle wall of partition that God set between Israel and the Gentiles and so since God set Israel they were supposed to be an example basically what happened was the world was all of one speech and one language in Genesis 11 and then the world united in rebellion against God to build a the Tower of Babel and worship the host of heaven instead of worshiping God so God sets up nationalism at that time creating different languages and different nations so that they can't communicate with each other and they can um, so then that way they won't a hall of man won't unite against God if a particular city like Sodom is re rebellion against God well then God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah with fire he doesn't have to destroy the whole world he can just just like he did with Noah and the flood when they committed sodomy he can do that with uh, just 
destroying a city and then the rest of the world goes on and so then God set apart a nation he says now I'm gonna show everybody what a nation that fears God should be like and he starts the nation of Israel with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 and he sets them apart above all nations so given the national preference for Israel in their program God forbids interracial marriage at that time he says don't marry the other the people from other nations because they're not my people since they're not my people they're going to lead you astray so he says don't marry another race so that's where that comes from but today Ephesians 2 14 says the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile has come down Romans 2 says God is not a respecter of persons between Jew and Gentile so today and again the goal of Israel's program and the reason God forbid interracial marriage at that time was because Israel was set apart as God's people so it's not that a white person could marry a black person because of the color of their skin it was a Jew couldn't marry some a Gentile because the Jew was God's chosen people and the Gentile was not so in other words God's chosen people or God's people should not marry people who are not God's people that was the goal of that law and so today since God is in respect of persons he's saving anybody who trusted us in Jesus death burial and resurrection as atonement for their sins then you can marry whoever you want only in the Lord first Corinthians 7 says only in the Lord so it's really the same rule that Israel got is that we should only marry believers <coughs> the difference is that believers in Israel's program are identified by a national status whereas in today's program uh, the mystery program the gospel of grace God is no respecter of persons whatever nationality you are you are saved in the same way so God still has the rule don't marry an unbeliever in the Old Testament don't marry an unbeliever meant Jews don't marry Gentiles but today in the dispensation of grace don't marry an unbeliever means don't marry someone who hasn't trusted in Jesus death burial and resurrection as atonement for your sin you are to only marry a believer what color or what race that believer is makes no difference to God now uh, just like with anything else it's hard for a man and a woman to get together live together for their lives because they think differently and if you have some body who is a different race than you who's brought up in a different culture to think differently you're going to have more struggles as a married couple than you would uh, otherwise so um, for that reason you may not want to get married to a person of a different race but if you are willing to uh, try to overcome the sex differences how men and women think differently and you are willing to overcome the race differences how different races think differently and commit your life to someone of a different race uh, then by all means do so there is no sin in that the sin is in marrying an unbeliever just like for Israel the sin was in marrying a Gentile because an unbeliever was equated with a Gentile back then today there isn't that so interracial dating and marriage is allowed by God with the caveat that you need to understand that uh, the more differences there are between you and your spouse the harder it is to going to be to live the rest of your life with them but if that's what you're willing to do then uh, more power to you so that's fine all right thanks for watching